invite you to take a moment to prepare your hearts and your minds to listen for a word from God in the reading of our Holy Scriptures. Our first reading comes from Paul's letter to the Colossians, the first chapter. May you be made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience, while joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in life. He has rescued us from the power of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn from all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that we might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile him to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. <coughs> Church in which he grew up. 
And so having been told that, I thought that this might be a good opportunity for those of you who are not real familiar with the liturgical calendar to get a, a kind of a refresher. And for those of you who are in confirmation, you want to pay attention because we'll be talking about this some more this afternoon. So in the liturgical calendar, the church year, it begins with the season of Advent. That word Advent, it literally means He comes. He is coming. Advent precedes the season of Christmas. It symbolically recreates the anticipation of God's people as they awaited the coming of God's Messiah. So next Sunday is the first season of Advent, which means that next Sunday, a week from today, that is the first Sunday in the liturgical year. So, Happy New Year. And then, of course, after the season of Advent comes the season of Christmas. That's the day of the arrival of that long-awaited Savior, born in Bethlehem. And there is, of course, Christmas Day, December 25th. But in the liturgical calendar, there is a season of Christmas. You all know that song, The Twelve Days of Christmas, right? That's because there are 12 days of Christmas. And then 12 days after Christmas comes Epiphany. Now there again is an Epiphany Day, which is the day that, is, that we celebrate the wise men coming to meet the baby Jesus. But there is also a season of Epiphany. And the season of Epiphany is all about Jesus being revealed as the Messiah to the whole world. Right? So it starts with the story of the three wise men who were the first Gentiles, the first non-Jews to worship Jesus as the Savior. And that's the season in which we also always hear the story of Jesus being baptized, and the voice of God is heard saying, This is my Son, my Beloved, in whom I am well pleased. The season of Epiphany always ends with the story of the Transfiguration, when Jesus goes up on the top of the mountain, and his clothes are transformed into this dazzling, bright, white light. Then after Epiphany, we have the season of Lent, which is a 40-day period of fasting and prayer, confessing our sins as we prepare ourselves for Easter. The 40 days of Lent remind us of the 40 days that Jesus spent in the wilderness being tempted. And then, of course, after Lent comes Holy Week. We celebrate the Last Supper on Monday Thursday. We remember the crucifixion on Good Friday. And then together, the church around the world celebrates Christ's resurrection on Easter Sunday. And then we're in the season of Easter for the next 50 days, until 50 days later we come to the day of Pentecost. And if you've been participating in the Acts Bible study in those small groups, then you'll remember that the day of Pentecost was the day that the Holy Spirit came to the disciples, and suddenly they were able to speak in all the languages of the world so that they could spread the good news of Jesus to every corner of the earth. And then, after the day of Pentecost, there is a great big stretch that lasts about six months, sometimes more, depending on how early Easter comes in the year, but at least six months, that is just called ordinary time. That's what we have been in for the last six, seven months in the church, ordinary time. There is this long, long stretch without any holy days. I mean, every once in a while we have a feast day that pops up that the Catholic Church would certainly celebrate, and then occasionally we celebrate here, like we did with the, the Feast of St. Francis, when we bless the animals out in front of the church. But there's this great big stretch after Pentecost without any holy days, until we come to the last Sunday in our liturgical calendar, which we have come to today. Today is the last Sunday in the liturgical calendar. Today is Christ the King Sunday. Christ the King. Christ the King is about worshiping Jesus as Lord and Savior of the entire world. Indeed, of the entire universe. 
On this holy day, the church declares that Christ is King, that one day every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Today we celebrate Christ reigning in glory. Which brings me to the purpose of all of this, this talk. Because now that you know what Christ the King is about, now that you know that today we are supposed to be celebrating Jesus Christ reigning in glory, you might be asking yourself, why this gospel reading for today? Why, on Christ the King Sunday, would they choose the reading of Luke's account of the crucifixion? I mean, why not Luke's account of the resurrection? Right? I mean, the resurrection is a miraculous display of God's power, and nothing says king quite so much as a big display of power. Or why not one of the stories that Jesus tells about what it will be like when the Son of Man returns in glory? I mean, those stories have the word glory right there in them. Why not one of those stories on Christ the King Sunday? In this morning's reading, Jesus is called a king, the king of the Jews. But he is called that in order to mock him, to torment him. In this morning's gospel reading, Jesus is tortured to death. Kings are not supposed to be tortured to death, are they? That was certainly the attitude that most people had when they first heard the story of Jesus thousands of years ago. Their response was, how could Jesus possibly be the Messiah? Because the, the Messiah was supposed to overthrow Rome, not be crushed by Rome. The Messiah was supposed to set Israel free from her oppressors and restore the line of David to the throne. And the, although Jesus was of the house and the line of David, he never sat on any throne, but hung on a cross. The Jews were expecting the Messiah to be a great military and political leader who would destroy all the enemies of Israel. And instead... Jesus was killed by those great military and political leaders of his day, by the enemies of Israel. And have things really changed so much since then? I mean, certainly we who are Christians today, we would be quick to call Jesus the Messiah, even though he was not a conqueror. We no longer define the Messiah's role as one of liberating a single nation from oppression, but as one of liberating the world from sin. And yet, don't we still fall prey to the temptation to put our trust in worldly power? <clears throat> Accumulate enough wealth, and we won't have to worry. Get the right person elected, or the right judge into the Supreme Court. And then all will be well. Strengthen our military sufficiently, and then we shall have nothing to fear. We are still tempted to seek our salvation in the institutions of this world. At least I know I am. I know that I am guilty of this. If I am not careful, I start to put my faith, my hope, in the rulers and the institutions of this world. And that is why this reading from Luke's Gospel, the story of the crucifixion, it has been so critical for me to hear it this week, so important for me and the church to reflect on and be reminded of what our Savior really came to do and how salvation really works. Three times in our reading, Jesus was taunted with the call, if you are really the Savior, then save yourself. First, the leaders tormented him with that call. And then the soldiers repeated that call. And finally, even the criminal who was hanging on a cross next to him said it. If you are really the Savior, then save yourself. 
Sisters and brothers, after everything that the Bible says that Jesus did, turning water into wine, healing people who were blind and paralyzed and stricken with leprosy, feeding 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, walking on water, calming a storm with just a word, after all of that, I have no doubt that Jesus could have saved himself had he wanted to. In fact, I have no doubt that with that kind of power, Jesus could have been exactly the kind of Messiah that the Jews were expecting him to be. An earthly savior who defeated all of the enemies of God's people. I mean, certainly the man who could have done all of those things had within himself the power to waltz right into the, to the palace and kick Herod out and sit himself down on the throne of David and just dare anybody to try to take it back from him. Certainly he had the power to do that. I mean, surely he could have done that, right? Surely he had the power to do that. Because after all, even Caesar had the power to do that. And Caesar had done exactly that to kings and rulers around the Mediterranean. And before Caesar, it was the kings of Assyria and Babylon and Greece. They had all done it at one time or another. After the Romans were gone, that game of thrones would continue. One great military and political leader would rise up and defeat all of their enemies and make themselves king and reshape the laws of the land according to their own will and everyone would obey their commands. Right up, of course, until another military and political leader would rise up to take their place. Jesus had no interest in that kind of revolution because that's not a real revolution. That's just a change of leaders without a change of values. That's a change in the rulership without a change in the rules. And Jesus, as God's Messiah, as our King, came to change the rules forever. Jesus came not to change who sat in the halls of power, but to change what was happening in the hearts of humankind. Any two-bit dictator can put a sword to somebody's throat and demand obedience and get it. But that is obedience that is inspired by fear and not obedience that is inspired by love. That is not God's way. God didn't want to change the world from the top down, but from the bottom up. God did not want to change the world from the outside in, but to use us to transform the world from the inside out. Clear back when Jesus began his ministry in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus told his followers, you have heard that it was said, you shall not commit murder. But I say to you, if you are already carrying hatred in your heart, then you're already guilty. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But if you are already carrying lust in your heart, then you have practically committed adultery already. See, for Jesus, salvation is not just about changing people's behaviors. Because any two-bit dictator can do that. Though removing sinful behavior, it starts with removing people's desire to sin. Real salvation requires a change in the hearts in order to then change behavior. And that is what Jesus came to do. Jesus came to rule not on a throne, but in our hearts. In fact, if you look at the 17th chapter of Luke's Gospel. Just a few chapters back from that crucifixion story that we heard this morning, it says this in verses 20 and 21. Once Jesus was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God was coming, and Jesus answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming with things that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for in fact, the kingdom of God is within you. On that cross, a perfectly innocent man was killed by our own anger and desperation and fear. 
And the cross served as a mirror to show us what we are capable of, even though we like to think that we are not capable of such atrocities. And on that cross, Jesus prayed for those who were crucified him, who asked that they would be forgiven of their sin, even as they were in the midst of committing it. And Jesus showed us what God's love and God's mercy look like. If you have never done it before, and even if you have done it before, sisters and brothers, ask Christ to come into your heart, to change you from the inside out. Changing our hearts, that is the only way that real change can happen. Thankfully, thankfully we have a Savior, we have a King, who has the miraculous power to change us from within. And then, working through us, can use us to change the world. Thanks be to God. Amen.